Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and I'll tell you what, after a tiny reduction of events over the New Year period, the industry has immediately ramped back up into full force it seems. Starbase Texas is screaming towards that first orbital flight test, loads to talk about just with Booster 7 and Ship 24 alone, as all of this was going on this week. We've got new insights from the sky at the Macy site, and Greg Scott back up over the site in Florida. We've got so much to cover with the Starship project, but then loads outside that. We have Falcon Heavy, OneWeb and Falcon 9 with another return to launch site mission. Big movements of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket, new James Webb Space Telescope excitement and finally some not so great news with a few missions too. Now, if you remember from last week's video, we talked about the testing contraption to verify that the orbital launch mount clamps were able to bear the stress of a fully loaded vehicle. Just hours after that video went live, SpaceX finished testing that last pair of clamps and then off it went. That testing seemed to go very quickly and efficiently, so a good result assumed there because the next day on Sunday, there was Booster 7 heading out of the Mega Bay. Turning onto Highway 4, beautiful scenes as it carefully made its way over to the launch site, hopefully for the last time. During the rollout, the launch tower preparation was underway with the chopsticks rising up the tower to welcome the roughly 70 meter tall monster into its arms. Here it sat within the arms until Monday. We were in for a fun day of action, also indicated by the massive 15 hour long closure starting at 2 a.m. Almost exactly on time, the road was closed, the pad was cleared, and then shortly after, Booster 7 was lifted gracefully out of the transport stand and into the air. Amazing detail that you can see right here is that SpaceX has added a lot of the engine location numbers to the inside of the engine bells, most likely to aid the workers in knowing exactly where they are underneath that vehicle. I imagine in a situation like this, you can lose your bearings real quick. Once it was secured, the arms quickly detached and started lowering for their next passenger, Ship 24, sitting right here all that time patiently waiting. For that, they deployed the ship lifting points real quick and ensured that Booster 7 would be sufficiently pressurized by connecting that booster quick disconnect. The ship was rolled in, up it went, and wow, was this an incredible shot of it being lifted and placed up on top of Booster 7. One thing that I think is super striking in this video is that the speed that the drone is flying around looks to almost exactly match the speed that the ship was being rotated around for stacking. I mean, how can you not be blown away by everything that SpaceX does here? And that is the third time Ship 24 and Booster 7 have formed a fully stacked Starship. So with each successful step, the orbital test flight looms even closer. Now, speaking of that, I want to remind you to beware of misinformation around this. I had a bunch of people super excited saying that they've already booked tickets to the orbital flight test rumored to be be on the 31st of January. What? That is a little over two weeks away. Yeah, exactly. This is false. A lie. And almost comically so based on what is still needing to be done. So what is the truth, or as close to the truth as we can speculate? We need to see the fully stacked complete cryo test. A wet dress rehearsal. They're then going to need to de-stack, perform extensive static fires of all of the engines on the booster. Now, how many will be at the same time, I'm not so sure. It would be cool to see the full 33 re-engine static fire, but that remains to be seen. They are then certainly going to need to repair the pad after that and let it cure again. They'll need to restack the ship. The flight approvals then need to be granted by the FAA, and then we should be about ready to fly. All of this can happen reasonably quickly, of course, if every single step goes to plan. Musk indicated his guesstimate here, saying that there is a real shot for the end of February, or at least in March. And boy, is the excitement growing. You don't want to miss any of the steps leading up to this colossal event as artistically rendered here by I Am Visual. That is some nice work. And as always, I'll be covering it in full force, so thanks for following along and supporting what I do. It is really amazing to see that the enthusiasm is ramping right back up. So back to Ship 24, one great sign that we can immediately see if we compare it to the previous destacking is that the static firing stiffeners here have been removed. 
Yes, that indicates that the ship should have completed its entire static fire campaign. The next time that these engines fire up will hopefully be right after stage separation. Another new addition, just like Ship 20 in the past, Ship 24 has now gained the flight recorders on the outside. These are placed here in the event of an ocean splashdown or a rapid unscheduled disassembly. The idea is that they should remain intact for recovery so that SpaceX can obtain all that sweet data. Data that wouldn't really be able to be beamed down via wireless comm systems. It's also worth noting that its lifting points are still on the nose, which it isn't going to fly with. That is another reason that we expect it to be destacked at least one more time before flight. Another sweet angle here of the lift by cosmic perspective. Terrific news here with Booster 7 with all of the upgrades that we have been wishing for whilst it was in the Mega Bay. It does seem that those robustness upgrades that Musk mentioned quite a while back are now in place. Let's start from the bottom and work our way up. First of all, the engine shielding is installed and it appears to be much stronger with a bunch of overlapping pieces. Also, it looks like SpaceX has added numerous vents, which I assume is going to aid in the prevention of further unexpected detonations. To make room for all of this, the engine shielding has been redesigned. This protrusion at each engine looks new, and some pipes are also making their way up around the engine shielding as well. At the forward dome, this new pipe has appeared, which seems to perfectly line up with this new permanent pipe on Ship 24. If you remember, before the last static fire, SpaceX installed temporary flex hoses on those very same engine chill ports. They have now been replaced by these welded permanent pipes. The idea here, we think, is that this will help SpaceX prevent oxygen building up within the skirt during the ascent. I just can't wait to see these very pipes in action during the last minutes of countdown when the engine chill is happening. So yeah, all of that was on Monday at Starbase with SpaceX lifting both vehicles within 12 hours. This has all collectively been extremely exciting progress towards the big event. There was still plenty more for the week though. On Tuesday, Booster 9, like some jealous sibling seeing all of those sweet Booster 7 Raptors and shields, took back off to the build site to presumably get its engines and shielding installed too. It will have a little to be smug about too, with it being the first to use the new electric thrust vector control with the engines, so I think that that is going to be a super exciting milestone. Just yesterday on Friday, SpaceX did a partial propellant load and we got to see some great venting from that newly installed pipe. They didn't seem to progress as far as we thought they might, so there may be a few incremental challenges that they are dealing with there. Now, something that took me a little by surprise was this. Yes, Ship 22 is going to be scrapped very soon. Tiles were removed prior to slicing it up and aft flap removal has occurred. Surprising not because I thought that they were going to do anything with it, but specifically why now? Could SpaceX simply be starting to clear out the rocket garden or is this an indication that a different ship is going to be retired? Perhaps Ship 25 or 26 is already becoming obsolete compared to the new ones in development. Watch this space because that's an interesting question. Travelling much further down the road and thanks to Mauricio, we can see that the Macy site work is continuing at an absolutely breakneck speed. Just in the past weeks, the teams have started on the systems next to the newly installed tanks, most likely in preparation for the plumbing to be installed. Right next to that, groundwork is well underway for yet another concrete pad. They sure are spreading those out nicely, aren't they? This newly delivered crane looks to be involved in preparation for quite substantial foundation work here, and Musk did confirm this week that the gun range is being turned into a rocket test facility. This, therefore, could very well be the groundwork for the new Raptor testing site. Quite a lot further down the road again, all right, across the country perhaps, Starbase Florida, and thanks again to Greg Scott for taking to the skies to get us an update. Finally, the tower arm carriage has been moved over to the launch site and it is now staged on top of the red truss segments. Thanks to views from Space Flight Now, we can see that not long after the flyover, the outer top dome for the mysterious tank was lifted into place. Then Thursday night, the arms themselves were moved over from where they've been assembled to be mounted onto that carriage. Following that, the entire assembly will be installed onto the tower. 
A seventh tower section is now built here, sitting with the six that were there from the last flight. This one here is a little shorter than the others. And then to top the week off here, NASA spaceflight captured a similar looking part of a water deluge system that is already installed at the Cape, and this one is moving away. Could this be heading to Texas to be installed at some point? Well, I'd like to think so. Zach here spotted what looks to be pipework for it via an RGV shot. All very speculative, but if that works out to be true, thinking that this will probably be installed after the first orbital flight test. So in collaboration with SpaceX, telco provider OneWeb sent another 40 satellites into orbit on Monday, January the 9th this week, lifting off from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral. This was the second flight on Falcon 9 to assist OneWeb in building out their satellite constellation, which is currently around 80% there. I just want to specifically point out this great shot as it roared past Max-Q on the way to orbit. I haven't seen a contra like this for quite a long time. It's quite dramatic there, isn't it? With main engine engine cut off, the first stage flipped around and began its boost back burn heading all the way back to landing zone 1. We've been seeing quite a few of these lately, haven't we? It is still great to watch even if it is a night mission. Not quite as nice as the daylight shots, but there we had the successful landing all seen from multiple camera sources. Almost exactly one minute later, second engine cut off, and it was soon time to get the job done and deploy these bad boys. After the second stage fired back up again to get into the final orbit, there was a few phases of deployment. First at 59 minutes in, and the second batch kicked off at 74 minutes in. Once done, it was mission accomplished and a very happy customer. Not so happy though was one of the original test sites in Alaska. After complaining to the FCC over the high costs for access and the unspecified technical issues, OneWeb decided to close down access to the remote Alaskan community. That is a bit unfortunate, and meanwhile the other remote sites are still open and apparently all okay, so perhaps some weird anomaly going on there. I think it's going to be interesting to see how OneWeb goes, considering that they are a direct competitor with SpaceX's Starlink. Oh, and just a cool little side note here as well. SpaceX shared that for the first time ever, all at once there were four rockets on four pads, along with two dragons in orbit. Speaking of which, the CRS-26 Dragon departed the International Space Station at a similar time, having been docked there since the end of November. That has of course since splashed down and been recovered. Now, remember to stay tuned for the big SpaceX launch of the month as well, of course. Yes, that is right, Falcon Heavy is launching off the pad once again with the USS F-67 mission, possibly just hours after this video actually goes live. SpaceX fired up all of the 27 Merlin engines in a colossal static fire midweek. So yes, this is ready to go. This is still a super interesting event, of course, given that the Heavy has only launched four times in the past. The most recent last year in November with USS F-44, which had a few visibility issues. Firstly, it was foggy at the ground level, and also the booster cameras on the return were obscured for a lot of the ride. It was still a fun event, of course, but hopefully we'll have better views for this one, which will launch just after sunset. If it's a clear sky, that should make for some amazing views of the plumes interacting as it passes into the fully sunlit altitudes. I can't wait, and similar to the last mission, it is also worth noting that this is another Another one where we are unlikely to get any views from the second stage due to the secretive nature of these USSF missions. The centre core, just like the previous mission as well, is being expended to get almost every bit of performance possible out of the colossal vehicle. The two boosters are both on their second flight and will come down for that dual touchdown at landing zone one and two. What? Stick it! Stick! Two landings Yes, that is without doubt my favourite reaction clip of all time, I think. Tori Bruno, United Launch Alliance's CEO, shared some beautiful stuff this week on the brand new Vulcan Centaur rocket. Just check this out. Here is Vulcan rolling out to board ULA's transport ship for the trip to Cape Canaveral. I just love the painted design on this rocket, and you'll also notice that the ends have been shrink-wrapped here. That is because they don't want water or dust entering the business ends of the rocket, so this is all going to be removed once safely inside on the other end. This is a nice close-up shot of it being wrapped prior to the rollout. 
I think my favourite new Insight shared though was the upper stage Centaur 5 along with the two incredible RL10 engines. They're my favourites and they are being prepared to be stacked on the booster. This first image I will just say looks like the engines are offset but it's actually just a weird angle. From further back it looks like this. You will also see these white covers for insulation and those I believe are going to remain on during the flight to try and keep that super cold liquid hydrogen and oxygen as cold as possible during the various engine burns that it needs to do. Those red covers will all be removed before flight I believe. So I've been so looking forward to this maiden flight which is still to send Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander on its way to the moon and along with that two Amazon Kuiper demonstration satellites. Now we finally have an announcement from Roscosmos midweek regarding the Soyuz MS-22 vehicle. That was of course the one believed to have been hit by a micrometeoroid sending its radiator coolant out into space. It seems now that the vehicle is going to be sent home to the surface without crew and then the next Soyuz MS-23 mission is going to be launched without crew autonomously around February the 20th in a little over a month. The crew are going to have their mission extended and will instead return on the new vehicle on a date to be announced in the future. A brand new breathtaking James Webb Space Telescope shot from just days ago here. This is NGC 346, a dynamic star cluster living within a nebula 200,000 light years away. Just take a look at the detail of that shot. In fact, astronomers have celebrated the incredible performance of the James Webb Space Telescope at the American Astronomical Society on Monday, January the 9th. And I just think this is a great moment to see. This marvel of engineering has blown all expectations that we had out of the water and it continues to meet or even exceed the specifications in the design. Sensitivity, resolution, you name it. The one issue that they have had of course is the micrometeoroid impacts on its mirrors. They have been slightly higher than expected but only having a small effect so far. It was stated though that there have been 21 impacts to date. Later in the year they are actually going to begin a slightly different observation pattern where they place the telescope away from the direction they predict the most micrometeoroid impacts impacts are going to occur. Speaking of the James Webb Space Telescope, I've been enjoying a few documentaries on just that with Magellan TV, also supporting this very video. Magellan TV is a hidden jewel of the streaming world. This amazing site offers the best value of any premium documentary streaming service with both high quality and affordable prices. And as the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play, you know that you're getting the best of the best. But that is not all. With a Magellan TV subscription, you'll have access to 4K content at all times and the best part, no ads ever. That's right, you can enjoy all the amazing documentary content that you want without any interruptions. As fans of space and science that I know that we all are, you'll love the massive collection of shows available here. From new revelations about Venus to plans to blast asteroids out of the sky, there's always something exciting and educational to watch. I was caught off guard watching the planet hunting with the James Webb Space Telescope documentary when they mentioned that all seven planets of TRAPPIST-1 are in resonant orbits with each other. There is always loads like that to learn so don't miss out on this rising star in the streaming world. Give Magellan TV a try from my link below and unlock a treasure trove of amazing content. Finally, a few not so great news items for the week. We've been awaiting the first ever launch to space from British soil with Virgin Orbit for quite some time. Their Boeing 747, dubbed Cosmic Girl, took off from Spaceport Cornwall late in the afternoon of January the 9th. Rolling down the runway, the sixth launch of one mission called Start Me Up was finally underway. Out it flew over the Atlantic Ocean off the south coast of Ireland, and finally it was time to release the rocket from underneath the wing. A little over over one hour after takeoff. As nine small satellites were sent on their way to space, the entire mission took place with all of us kind of scratching our heads. There were jubilant messages on social media soon after saying that orbit had been attained. Strangely though, around half an hour later, those celebratory missions were soon replaced with the unfortunate news that they had in fact not reached orbit at all. So what happened? Well, as much as we could piece together from the stream and what was confirmed later, the second stage didn't perform as expected with some kind of anomaly occurring at around 180 kilometers in altitude that ended the engine burn. 
from the live stream, there wasn't really many useful clues at all because the data here was super erratic. The on-screen speed, altitude, and the propellant loads were just all over the place. Anyway, that is a sad loss for those payloads on board, and with now two failures out of six missions, Virgin Orbit are going to need to work hard to build confidence in the vehicle. Hopefully the next launch is going to have a better result. It was also a tough week for ABL Space Systems with the RS-1 rocket experiencing an anomaly and shutting down right after liftoff on its maiden flight. Now, you may recall me talking about this little rocket a few times last year. It's essentially a small rocket designed to place up to 1350 kilograms into low Earth orbit. It's a two-staged vehicle with nine E2 engines on its first stage and one vacuum E2 engine on the upper stage. It's all fueled with kerosene and liquid oxygen. Sadly, there was no public live footage of this launch, so nothing much to actually look at, but there were some shots that were shared later on ABL's social media. At this point, they are obviously working through the fault process with the FAA, and yes, this is yet another reminder of just how hard it is for these brand new vehicles to get to orbit. So that is about it for the week, but I wanted to thank you for all the enormous feedback from my questions last week about the video format here. The overwhelming opinions did seem to be that I should stick with the format and really not change anything too drastically. I really appreciate you taking the time to write in. Believe it or not, it can be a pretty isolating sort of experience making content like this. It may not always seem overly obvious, but I spend a load of time in an office by myself, quietly writing away, recording and editing, along of course with the team helping helping me remotely here. But yes, it can be really hard to gauge the opinions of you in a way that provide a clear answer, but you all nailed it, so thank you. Thanks a heap as well to the brand new patrons that have signed up over the past weeks as well. That is super helpful, especially in these first few months of the year where YouTube revenue fluctuates quite erratically. Super grateful to each and every one of you here. It is awesome to be able to chat directly with you as well, which we can do within Patreon or Discord. I also noticed the other day that Spreadshirt, who manage this merch, are offering a huge free standard shipping discount, just so you know, and that starts Saturday today and continues until Tuesday the 17th, I believe. That can work out to be quite a big saving, especially if you are outside of the US where those costs are definitely higher. As always, thanks a bunch for watching all this way through. If you missed the 2022 compilation that we did the other week, check that out from the bottom left in the second half of the video. And then these two deeper dive topics if you want to learn a little more about the challenges of galactic cosmic radiation or other problems to overcome overcome for long-term deep space missions. Have a great week. I'll catch you for the next video.